ask for his blessing so that we may tru truly understand that which is being written here in years past that is for our admonition at this time. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you, to learn more of you, to be guided of you, to seek your face. We thank you for the challenges of the week that are past. We thank you for the blessings that you have provided. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come, to join together, to seek, to be together in spirit and in truth so that we may go forward in the manner in which you would have us to do. Help us now as we open your word. Bless those that are at this meeting. Bless those that will view it later. Direct us now. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we return to where we left off this last week, we are now in the book of Joel. What has been the overriding message, the overriding theme of this portion of the book of Joel? Is Joel not calling us to repentance? Yeah, well, there's a warning about what's going to be coming. Right. So, so obviously that there's then that call to repentance. That's this part here, uh, 13, 15, et cetera. So as, as the translators had seen this, we begin this new section in Joel 1.14. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. So here we are to sanctify a fast. Comparing this with 2 Chronicles 20 verses 3 and 4. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask the help of the Lord, even out of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Now, here, in sanctifying this fast, and in calling a solemn assembly, what are we being shown to do? What is... What what exactly is going on here? Are we not being called away from our regular labors and our regular cares of the world? What does it mean in this where it says call a solemn assembly, but the alternate reading calls this a day of restraint? Why are we being told that we are to have a day of restraint? How do they get a day of restraint out of that? 
Well, uh, there's nothing about restraint here. See, I'm trying to figure that out. So okay. There's nothing there about restraint in the word at all. I mean, it it means basically to um to gather together to, to enclose uh, from the root, it comes from the root to enclose, I guess by analogy to hold back, that is usually uh, to keep something out, right? Right. Um, where we would think of restraint as, you know, sort of, um, and, that, and that's just from the root word, not the word itself. The word itself just means an assembly. So, so I don't know if restraint is a good way of looking at it. Well, as the translators looked at this, they gave reference back to Leviticus 23.36. And as that verse reads, seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day, shall be a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. Right. So that's the word solemn assembly. So, so I, I, I just think that, you know, the idea of restraint doesn't really make sense here, the day of restraint. Um, I mean, in the sense of, that we're gathering together um, and keeping the things of the world out. I mean, that would be, that would make sense. Okay. Right. Cause that's kind of implied in the word. So a solemn, that's why a solemn assembly, it's not, you know, all of the, the things of the world are kept out. So it fits in with what you were talking about. Right. Any other thoughts? So I thank you for this, Theodore. That, you know, I'm, I'm not a student of Hebrew. In this, I'm taking just the way that the translators had presented this in the 1769 King James. Now, the next verse, Joel says, Alas, uh, Dwight, so just one yeah. of the things, so they can put a word into English, so that's one thing you always have to be um, aware of, is they put it into English in a word that in English then means or implies something different than it does in English today. Okay. So, you know, so what they would even mean by a day of restraint, to them, they might understand it much more in line with the Hebrew. Uh, than with the English word restraint used today. Because, you know, you think about a day of restraint, that would be a little bit different. But um, but you can, uh, the, the thing that you can do with uh, ESORT or any good sort of lexicon is you can look at all the scriptures where a Hebrew word is used. You don't really need to know Hebrew. Right. Where that particular word is used and see the context and, and the various ways that it's translated. Um, sometimes there's words that we don't see very often in the Bible. And those, those they have to look at other literature that's not in the Bible to understand that word. But uh, in this case, if you look up that word, um, the, the one that's the root, the 6113, so that's, that's the one that they uh, translated as it does so that's the one where the word solemn assembly comes from to right to restrain to halt to stop to retain uh, be restrained in the niffle form to be stayed or up be under restraint so that uh, restrain retain close up shut withhold refrain stay detain 
so you can see if it's a solemn assembly where we're closed up, we're brought together, right, in this solemn assembly. Um, but if you look up that word, you know, the different places where it's used, um, so this is just kind of an example for people who are trying to do this. If you look up, it first shows up in Deuteronomy 11, 17, um, where he shut up heaven, right? Right. Of course, that's the root word that's being used as solemn assembly, right? But so you can look up that root word. You can look up everywhere uh, it's used. And it's usually translated as shut up or stayed. He held, withheld something. His hand, he restrained himself from doing something. His hand was stayed or the plague was stayed. Um, but then when you look up the word itself that's translated as solemn assembly, you'll see that it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's spelt slightly differently, but just has a different form of the word. And it usually means meeting or assembly, and also sometimes solemn assembly, such as in, uh, uh, and it's going to be used in, uh, it's kind of, they have it in Joel chapter 2. They don't show, show it in Joel chapter 1 for some reason in the concordance. Anyway, so hopefully that's helpful for people looking up words. Okay. I think it's, you know, all these little pieces that we bring together are always very helpful. Because we need to have a, a clear understanding of what's being said in Scripture. Now, when we are told to gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land, <clears throat> here again, if we were to look at this from 2 Chronicles 20, verse 13, we are told then that all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Was anyone excluded in this example out of 2 Chronicles? Everyone was uh, told to present themselves, meaning everyone was uh, there. Okay, I heard part of what you said, brother, but in the in the large larger definition, who is being gathered together here? Is the world being gathered here? Or is this just those that are looking to follow after God? Is it just those that are looking to honor God? Uh, these are the ones who are honoring God, the remnant, are the ones uh who you understand and uh, the ones who are going to, to, to assemble. Right. So any of those that would be the, of the Gentiles, any of those that are outside, that are choosing not to study line upon line, that are choosing not to follow God as it is written, they are not part of the solemn assembly. All of those that are saying that we are looking to do this, we those are the ones that are being called. Now, a comment from the chat, which I have to agree with. The atmosphere just before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost must have been just as solemn and just as soul-searching. Do we have any other thoughts about that?
Okay, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Does God ever execute a judgment without first giving a warning? What do you think and what do you say? He always warns first. Agreed. <clears throat> if he always warns first, then we have a time of preparation, a time of reflection, and a time for repentance. Did we not see this before the flood? Is this not recorded for our admonition? Is it not shown in various books of the Old Testament, the warning about the initial advent of Christ? Does the world not hear many of the things, many of the warnings that are being given and yet, just like before the flood, set these aside that these things can never happen, would not happen, because things have gone on just as they have in the days of our fathers. But yet here we are. We have warnings that have been given. And many of these warnings have not been heeded. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down. For the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. Now, as Mrs. White wrote in the book Education, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place around us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Now, How often are we seeing this where there are some that believe that these events of the world are to be literally reenacted? Excuse me, I'm sorry. What did you say? How often are we seeing that there are those that believe these events of the world, events that are being predicted in the Bible, are to be literally reenacted? <laughs> um, it's funny you should put it quite like that. Um, I believe. I know there's a lot that don't, but I believe. Okay. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife, that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. 
And when God shall bid his angels to loose the winds, there shall be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. If the pen of Mrs. White could not picture this, if the pen of the prophets of the Bible cannot picture this, then this must indeed be a very fearsome scene. The Bible and the Bible only gives a correct view of these things. Here are revealed the great final scenes of the history of our world, events that already are casting their shadows before the sound of their approach causing the earth to tremble and men's hearts to fail them for fear. If we are being shown that the Bible alone gives a correct view of these things, then are we foolish to set aside the Bible for the wisdom of man? Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. They have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. The mirth of Tabrits ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoiceth endeth, and the joy of the harp ceaseth. Isaiah 24, 1 to 18. I would have to say that this is pretty much edited. But it makes a point. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The seed is rotten under their clods, the garners lay desolate, the barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How, do, how the beasts do groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed, because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of man. I am pained at my very heart. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard. O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. So I wonder why that was. They, they refused to listen to the message? I would say that, that that looks to be the case. Hmm. Interesting. Present circumstances and all. Okay. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. And all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down. Jeremiah 4, 19, 20, and 23 to 26. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Now, is there anything symbolic that we can take away from these passages of Jeremiah?
would this not be as a midnight before the world? So you have, uh, well, the, you have the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah th uh, 30 there. Right. You're about, I don't know, a midnight before the world. What does that, what, what do you mean by that? They've accepted the darkness that is, is their oh, choice. I see what you're saying. But okay. you're not talking about the way mark midnight. No. Okay. I was, I was trying to figure that out. Okay. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Here we are beginning to read from Ninth Testimony, page 14, paragraph 2. So we are coming to the point that is after Nine Testimony 11. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and it maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. The mirth of Tabret ceases, the noise of them that rejoiceth endeth, the joy of the harp ceases. Isaiah 24, 1 to 8. Here again, Joel 1, 15 to 18, along with verse 12, are again repeated. And Jeremiah 4, 19 and 20. I am pained at my very heart. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard. O oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. What do we see if the whole land is spoiled? Is this not a total destruction yes roger that now again she quotes i beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void where have we heard this description before repeat that well it's at creation yes Thank we, you. I, I think I got that. Okay. We are seeing this, that Jeremiah is again repeating what Moses had written about the condition of the earth prior to Christ speaking his creative power. Did you read my I am? Not yet. <laughs> well, I, apparently you don't have to. Now, the heavens, and they had no light. If the heavens have no light, then what kind of light is upon the earth? Ask that question to me again, please. As Jeremiah has beheld the heavens, and the heavens had no light, then what kind of light is there upon the earth? Well, that would be dark light, right? Or darkness. There is no light at that point. I would think that there is no light. Correct. So that's the darkness. So what do we have um, in our darkness? Don't. Don't we have the rays of the sun being reflected off the moon? 
Literally, yes. Here we're speaking prophetically. I beheld the mountain. Wait a second. You, yeah. you just said something about a literal fulfillment at the end. And, and I, I don't understand, please. No, I said that, you know, well, your comment was to ask if the rays of the sun were not reflected off of the moon. Oh, oh, well, actually, I was that was symbolism for spirit of prophecy. Yeah, but in this case, you wouldn't have that either. Because you don't always have the moon. Yeah, you don't have the spirit of prophecy either at that time. Interesting. Well, yeah, there's no light from God. This to be understood symbolically. Not until after the creation, right? Well, this is not talking about the creation. What exactly are you talking about? Or what's he talking about? about Jeremiah, you tell me? Jeremiah chapter um, 4, verse 23 to 26. We're talking here about the desolation that comes upon the earth. That's Jeremiah 4, 20, you said? 4, 20, what? 23 to 26. It's quoted in Nine Testimonies, page 15. Uh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 4. Do you, do, you see, do you see the verses in front of you at all, Ron? Well, I'm working on that. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Um, my fingers are a little bit shaky. Okay. Uh, uh, I would actually go up to 420, verse 420. That's just me, though. She quotes for verse 20 as well. So she quotes verse 19. Really? 23 and 26. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to flesh something else out that just seems to be real significant to this moment in time and space. Okay, well, could you possibly just not, um, can you let us have this study? Because you're, you're distracted. Uh, 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 look, I, I got to go. I got another uh, fish on the hook. Okay, well then go do that. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled. And all the hills moved lightly. I beheld and lo, there was no man. And all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down. Here we are now in this prophetic picture. We are being shown the desolation that is occurring. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And now we're coming into the last portion of the, of the first book of Joel. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field Cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Joel is showing us that we have an opportunity. We are being called to repentance. We are being called to gather together. We are being called to cry unto the Lord before these judgments come into the land. Are we willing to accept this admonition and this instruction from Joel? 
or are we going to walk contrary to God? Now, as Mrs. White stated, and as we have accepted, that the prophets of prior years wrote more for our time than they wrote for their own time. So we would have to accept that the book of Joel is written as an admonition for us. Does anyone have an issue with that statement? Now I'm placing a new a new share in front of you. Can you see this on the screen? Yep. Okay. Now, as the translators would have it at the beginning of this book, what is the first thought? that is being placed before us to examine. Exhortation to repentance. Now, what does it mean to exhort someone? To plead with them. To plead with them how? Emphatically. Yes. Is this not the way that we are to approach things in giving the message that God pre presents before us to those that are within the movement and within the church? Are we not to be emphatic about what we are seeing regarding this time of verse history? and regarding our responsibility unto God. Now, Isaiah is given a vision. He's given the vision of the horses and their angelic riders. At the prayer of the angel, comfortable promises are made to Jerusalem. And then at the end, we have the vision of the four horns and of the four carpenters. From letter 154 of 1906, Mrs. White writes, when we reached San Francisco on our way back home, we took a carriage and rode through the streets of the city for an hour and a half. We went up to Van Ness Avenue and on to our church building. The meeting house was still standing. It had sustained some damage that can be soon repaired. It would have been a hard matter to arouse courage sufficient to rebuild if it had been destroyed. Beautiful Jefferson Park, close by the church property, is filled with tents and with people. San Francisco in ruins is the most complete, thorough, awful calamity I have ever looked upon. In the night season, I've had many presentations of the judgments of God coming upon our cities. And now I can understand better the real meaning of these scenes that I have witnessed. In Micah, we read, and here Mrs. White quotes verses one, from chapter 1, verses 2 to 7, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, 7, 12, and then we have 13. And then she quotes Micah chapter 3. Oh, how soon the scenes of destruction and desolation will come and be universal. We cannot tell. Be ye also ready, saith the Lord. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 44. In Habakkuk, we read. 
And we are to quote Habakkuk 2, verses 1 and 2. It will not tarry beyond the time appointed. So what is it that will not tarry? The vision. You were kind of mum muffled there, sorry. The vision, he said. The vision. So as we read this, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and shall not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Do we not have the vision written upon tables? Yeah. Is this and, not, excuse me, go ahead. Well, yeah, so both charts start with 677. So this is the Chazon vision. Does the vision in any way become untrue? No. Nope. So if we hear pastors, if we hear evangelists telling us that the end of time is the end of prophetic time, but then following and saying as an Adventist, giving you dates for future event beyond October 22nd, 1844, bless that person and just pay as little attention to them as possible. And this includes the 2520. If we were to hear someone say that, how are we to respond? The vision does not lie. The vision will not tarry beyond the time appointed. The 1843 and the 1850 charts are that which has been prophesied. And that prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes. Mrs. White also quotes Habakkuk 2, verses 3 to 20. And if I understand that correctly, she is then quoting the entirety of that chapter. In Zephaniah, we read, and she quotes the entire book of Zephaniah. Then she makes the comment, in connection with these scriptures, read the first four chapters of the prophecy of Zechariah and the entire book of Malachi. These scenes will soon be witnessed, just as they are clearly described. I present these wonderful statements from the scriptures for the consideration of every one. The prophecies recorded in the Old Testament are the word of the Lord for the last days and will be fulfilled as surely as we have seen the desolation of San Francisco. We are now 117 years after the destruction of San Francisco. We are now 118 years after the warning that she gave regarding Nashville. In this, she has given us an admonition. We are being told that these scenes will soon be witnessed. 
What does that mean to us that these scenes will soon be witnessed? Meaning they will come to pass? Exactly. Is Ellen White a false prophet? No, uh, because uh, she even wrote about uh, 20, 20.001. That's in testimony of volume nine. Right. Uh, yeah, she's a true prophet. Now, does it make one a false prophet to place these warnings before all of the people? No, because uh, when God wants to do something, he warns people through the prophets. So that's the way God works. Right. Whenever we have one that is placing a warning before the people, are they not acting like a trumpet? Are they not warning the people that these events are soon to take place? Correct. Meaning they want people to repent and uh, follow the right path. Exactly. Will anybody of men bring upon themselves the displeasure of the Lord by framing a law for the observance of a spurious Sabbath and then compelling obedience to this law? Will they insult God by profaning his holy day and assuming authority as gods to exalt the first day of the week to be observed by all? How can men set aside the true Sabbath when they know that God came to our world and from Sinai's mount in awful grandeur proclaimed his law to be observed in commemoration of the day he had ordained as a day of rest? a day ever to be kept as a memorial of God as the creator of the heavens and of the earth. He made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day and was refreshed. He sanctified the seventh day because that in it he had rested. He instituted the Sabbath as a memorial, pointing to the fact that he was the creator of the world the monarch of the universe. The Lord has given to men the day that he has chosen to be observed by all the world and regarded as a sacred rest day. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Bekiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, the Lord has been with displeasure with your fathers. Now, since this took place in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, about what year did this admonition come from Zechariah? This is 520. I'm just trying to figure out. In the eighth month, it might be 520. might be 519. Okay. Thank you. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. It's probably uh, November of 520. Okay. So if it's November of 520, that would be about 18 years after 
Babylon has fallen? Yeah, 19 years. Okay. The words in Malachi 3, verses 1 to 4, lay down the work essential to be done in the church of God. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, saith the Lord. Whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like the refiners, a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. And they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, a message which is as a two-edged sword is to be given to the people to clear the way of the evils that are seen among them, a living testimony that will awaken the paralyzed conscience is to be done. It is to be born. A work is to be done to cleanse our institutions from every evil. Is this work to be set aside? Uh, sorry for a distraction here, but it's kind of interesting. So this uh, eighth month, yes, in the second year of Darius, yes. Um, if you went to the first day of the eighth month, yes, uh, that well, that month it in the Babylonian calendar that's lunation number two eight one seven. So backwards, that's July eighteen two. Fantastic. Um, but also, uh, um, if you if you look at uh, the Mayan long count, yes, uh, number it's six eleven eleven, and then the last two digits would be seventeen ten or seventeen eleven, depending on which time of day it is. If it was late. If it was afternoon, then it would be seventeen eleven. Um, which is interesting because 17 times 11 is 187. So it's just, just an interesting note about that. Uh, so we have 81, which we use as a symbol of midnight. Right. July 18 symbols there. So. And then, like you were just saying, you have you have this 1711 at the end of the day. Yeah. And 17 times 11 would give us what? 187. Exactly. And it's October 27th, not that that, I don't know what that would mean particularly, but that the month starts on October 27th. Now in, um, in Zechariah, they're going to have, um, you know, another date and that's going to be, so, so there that he's going to start prophesying on the eighth month, but they don't tell him, tell us what day of the month, but it's often assumed it's the first day of the month. Okay. Just because he says it's the eighth month, he doesn't say which day. So it's assumed that it must be the first. If it wasn't, he would tell us which day it is. Right. So anyway. So in other words, what we're looking at this in the eighth month, the second year of Darius, we have this being very pregnant with symbols that we are now recognizing as being very important at this time in Earth's history and for this movement. And I will come near to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his rights, and fear not me, saith the, ver saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 5. All the sins here specified have been coming in among the people who claim to be the people of God. 
and it is high time that there was a reformation, a transformation of character. Who among us, who are called commandment keepers, have been partial in the law, neglecting the living principles, which are a transcript of the character of God? Has not the imperfect example of those who have departed from the law of God caused many to stumble at the law? Therefore have I made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Malachi 2 9. How is it that we are partial in the law? And is this applicable to us today? I would like you to consider that at this point. And we will look to answer this at some point in the future. So are we being partial in the law? There can be no offering made to the Lord in righteousness until practical right doing is brought into the daily life. When does God say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in the former years? When he shall be a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then I turned, writes Zechariah, and lifted up mine eyes, and looked and beheld a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof is ten cubits. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off, as on the other side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and he shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Where else in scripture are we finding the offering and the stones being consumed? Uh, to do with Elijah at the Mount Carmel. Yes, on Carmel, it was seen there at that time. Where else? When Gideon stood before the Lord. Was it just his sacrifice that was consumed, or wasn't the rock consumed as well? Judges 6.21 will correct me. 
for it states there that the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So fire came from the rock. Fire came from the stone. Here, we are going to see that this is going to consume the house with the timber and the stones thereof. And then the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. You shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. And if you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day ye offer it, and on the morrow. And if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is abominable. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone that eateth it shall bear his iniquity, because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Leviticus 19, 1 to 8. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God has revealed his character toward fallen man by giving them a savior, Jesus Christ. He covenanted not to stir up his wrath against the perversity of his children, not to censure them in his hot displeasure until every advantage has been given them through all their period of probation. And even when they shall refuse his warnings, his messages of invitation, the presentation of his righteousness, when they consume to sin, when they continue to sin in the face of light and evidence, still he will not break forth upon them his great anger. He leaves all judgment to his son, whom he gave as a sin offering to the world. It's interesting as we cover the studies of righteousness by faith. It is interesting to see that in the way that Jones had approached, had approached this. We would have a situation where we must be both justified and sanctified in order to be able to properly accept his message at this time. God has a yearning desire to save the purchase of the blood of Christ from the sure result of a wrong course of action, which, if persisted within, will bring upon them the wrath of the rejected lamb. Mercy, rich and free, is presented in the gift of Christ's righteousness. Those who scorn this precious gift, who despise and reject the Savior, who refuse the invitation, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. Reject the offer of the attributes of a character which will constitute them sons and daughters of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What name? Emmanuel, 
the Son of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth, John 1, 12 to 14. The word is our instructor. All who will be doers of the word in sincerity and in truth will behold his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There, then there is indeed a new birth, a transformation of character. Are we to wait until Christ's return for this new birth and this transformation of character? Is that what's being said here? I would say that we need this new birth now. Well before Christ returns. We need to have this transformation of character to be able to lift up a message. To be able to give this message to the world of his fullness have we received and grace for grace this makes us living epistles known and read of all men 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2 he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things unto his hands. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3, verses 33 to 38. Or excuse me, 33 to 36. God has declared in his word that the seventh day is a sign between him and his chosen people, a sign of their loyalty. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Ezekiel 20, verses 19 and 20. If the Sabbath is accepted, the rest of the commandments in the Decalogue will be obeyed. For no one can truly keep the Sabbath and disregard one precept of the law. Is this not telling us again, if you break one, you break them all? Yes. All who have intelligence and a knowledge of the scripture are without excuse in regard to the day which God has enjoined upon man. All who have intelligence, all who have a knowledge of the scriptures are all without excuse regarding the day which God has enjoined. From the pillar of cloud, Christ constantly set before his church in the wilderness their requirements of God. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Matthew 
the Lord often tested his people to see if they would have faith in him. This is a very direct statement. How many joined together today in this meeting have not seen some kind of testing come upon this movement or in their life? How often are we tested? How often do we praise God for the tests that are upon us? He allowed the supply of water to fail that the Israelites might be reminded of their past deliverance and be led to put their trust in God, but their continual blessings for which they should have been ever grateful led them to forget their dependence. No sooner did their supply of water fail than when they forgot God, and blame Moses as the cause of their calamity in the place of trusting God, who had so long and so liberally supplied their wants. They gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron and bitterly reviled them for bringing them out of Egypt. Oh, how easily this unbelief springs into life. This is the danger yesterday. Is that right? This is the danger today. The people of God must keep a continual watch over their hearts, lest they allow Satan to interpose between them and their God. Brothers and sisters, how often are we watching our hearts today? How often are we allowing our adversary to interpose between ourselves and our God. How long is God willing to suffer this to allow to happen? What are we to do? If we're being tested, we need to accept the test. We need to come through this test to see ourselves Proved. How are we to be approved unto God? What does Paul write to Timothy? We need to understand how to separate scriptures. For, for us uh, to be approved, we need to understand between right and wrong. Agreed. And as Paul stated, study to show thyself approved unto God. Would you agree with that? Amen. If we are not willing to study, if we are willing to accept the word of other men as a replacement for the gospel, are we then studying to show ourselves approved unto God? Or are we studying to gain the admonition of men? What are we doing? We're trying to please men. If we're trying to please men, then what are we doing? Are we not worshiping an idol? Correct. Are we then breaking a commandment that tells us, thou shalt have no other gods before me? True. 
if we are then breaking that commandment, how can we then keep the Sabbath in spirit and in truth? We can't because it simply means we are not free. We are not at rest. Correct. Are we passing the test in a situation like that or are we failing the test? With that kind of spirit, meaning we are failing the test. Right. Often physicians are called upon the Sabbath to minister to the sick. And it is impossible for them to take time for rest and devotion. The Savior has shown us by his example that it is right to relieve suffering on this day. But physicians and nurses should do no unnecessary work, ordinary treatment, and operations that can wait should be deferred until the next day. Let the patients know that physicians must have one day for rest. The Lord says, Verily, my Sabbaths shall ye keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. Exodus 31, 13. I look at this verse. I look at the admonition that is given in this verse. The numbering of the verse is interesting. 3113. Because no matter how we read this, no matter how we look at this, it is the same going from left to right as it would be from right to left. 3113. Let no man, because he is a physician, feel at liberty to disregard the word of the Lord. He should plan his work so as to obey God's requirements. He should not travel on the Sabbath except where there is real suffering to be alleviated. When this is the case, it is not a desecration of the Sabbath for physicians to travel upon that day, but ordinary cases should be deferred. How much and how better can we truly show medical missionary work than in the time in which we allow our physicians, our nurses, our medical ministers to relax to enjoy the recreation, the recreation upon the Sabbath. We are to do no unnecessary work upon the Sabbath. Yet how many times do we see this occurring? Now, we have a few minutes remaining in today's time together. Do we have any questions or comments or thoughts for that which we have covered so far? How is it that we can repent if we are not willing to accept the law and the word just as it is written? Are 
Okay. I know it's a bit early, but let us now close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. Our hearts are deceitful above all things. We need you, Father, to show us that which is most necessary for us today. Help us, Father. Guide us. Show us. All of these things that we need to understand so that we may more completely worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with those that must travel today. Guide us in all things. Show us that which you would have us to understand. May our minds be open to receiving your word. May we be able to do that which you would have us to do. Now and always, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.